Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Write or Die show. I'm your host, Randy Lee Bosla. On the show, we interview other writers and we talk about mental health from their personal journeys. If you have not already hit that like and subscribe button, go ahead, do that now so that you never miss an episode. So today with us, we have A.G. Flitcher. Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, well, today I'm good, but I was uh, pretty raw uh, for maybe two weeks because um, okay. I think February 23rd, uh, that was the eight year anniversary of my mother's passing. Oh, I'm sorry. And um, work was rather tense that day because a coworker of mine was having disagreements with our manager and I was literally in between them as they're uh not shouting so much but arguing at each other and just standing there like a little kid like why is mommy and daddy fighting oh no <laughs> so uh even though i'm used to that kind of stuff the way my coworker latched on to anger for the rest of the day even though i had to work with him um oh. it triggered uh i guess old wounds to open up again you know in a way that made me uh in the same mental state of rawness that i had already you know done so much work on myself mentally and and progressed forward and then i ended up regressing so oh, yeah. before this interview actually it was, it was actually kind of me gearing up for this interview and for my own uh mental stability i was listening to this podcast on uh, spotify called um therapy in a nutshell oh. I, I don't know if you've heard of that um so they they talk a lot about how you process emotion and and how you use your emotions as tools to not only further yourself in your life but also how you approach your strong emotions and i i naturally have strong emotions and very transparent in in my approach to how i exercise them so when i feel raw i feel really raw and I, I don't want to um, get back into the, the old habits I used to have of fixating on one and then going into this weird headspace where I can't really focus on anything. I'm, I'm, I'm on autopilot and I hate being on autopilot because it means that my, my awareness I'm always working on takes a dip. So yeah. when I was listening to those, to those uh, episodes, when, it was also promoting a course, but it gave me enough tools and things to think about to uh, get back to um, the place I wanted to be and continue moving on from that place. So I'm all good. Excellent. So, what, okay, tell us the name of that podcast one more time in case people want to go check Therapy it out. Therapy in a nutshell. You can also find it on YouTube. Nice. I like that. Therapy in a nutshell. I like the title of it too. It's kind of fun. Yeah. The, what, what I thought was so cute is there's a picture of uh, of a walnut shell cut in half and it shows uh, the human brain. And it, it's, hmm. I guess it's their logo of the, literally your brain in a nutshell for therapy. Yeah. I was like, well, that's clever. <laughs> that is so clever. It's <laughs> much more clever than mine. It's just a open book <laughs> writing. That's okay. <laughs> Um, all right. So uh, tell us uh, who, a little bit about who it is that you are. Uh, well, I guess <laughs> to quote Jim Carrey, uh, I play different characters of myself. I, I don't know if you've, you've heard him when his, he did his uh, commencement speech for, I don't know which university, but he was saying how uh, I am not Jim Carrey. I am playing a character called Jim Carrey. Meaning, whatever face he decides to present to uh, the public eye or uh, people at parties, those are different facets of who he is. So, mm -hmm. without getting a little bit too philosophical here, uh, who is Andre? Who is A.G. Fletcher? Uh, Andre is um, someone who was born in Canada, but is someone who comes from an Egyptian bloodline oh. and Greek as well. Uh, and surprisingly, do you still live in Canada or have you moved? Yeah, I was I was born here. Uh, I yeah, too. Did my you my know family that? is is from Egypt, and um, I have some people uh, I know from uh, Greece. 
that that's my so dad's cool. Side. I've always wanted to go to Greece. Mm -hmm. Um, but digging deeper, uh, as for who I am as a person, like outside of writing and work life, I would say I am a very transparent and genuine person. Um, it's, it's what makes me a terrible liar. <laughs> <laughs> then you're going to fit right into the show because we get, you know, it's all about the truth here. Yeah. And I mean, that that's really what, uh, you know, sparked my my interest in writing because when I when I hear, you know, infamous authors talking about the whole truth within the lie, uh, it really captivated me, the, the whole concept of uh, bridging fiction and reality. So I always look at, you know, events and people in my life. And that's something else you can know about me is that I've lived more than I expected to, obviously. I rather, you know, <laughs> eventful life. Um, when I was eight, my dad was T-boned by a garbage truck. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he's he's okay. He he can't run anymore, but he's not handicapped. So wow, I, that's amazing though. Yeah. Uh, my yeah, mind so, went to like the deepest, darkest place when you said that. And I yeah, I was I was eight years old when it happened. So uh, I won't get into too much detail about it because uh, I'll be here for hours talking about stories. <laughs> But essentially what happened is there's a, there's a T road and they're both trying to go in, at the same time in the same direction. And uh, his, his truck was rather small and it mm -hmm. got stuck underneath. So he ended up getting an artificial hip and uh, mm -hmm. part of his foot replaced. Um, he, he was very lucky to, to be alive. So yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was 24, when I was 24, my my mom uh, passed away from breast cancer. Oh, yeah. So that night, I think, uh, yeah, two, uh, February 23rd was the eight year anniversary. So, so you just I told was, us how old you are if we did the math. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm 32. So it, it's it's been a while, but of course, you know, internal scars never go away and. Hopefully life grows around that scar in, in a good way. Um, I like that. Can I steal that saying? Life grows around the scar. I, I really like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I people have been telling me that my whole life. So I just kind of adapted it to how I go about life. You know, I mean, people always look at me like, Andre, why do you look so tired? I'm like, because I am. And, and it's because I'm always striving to do the things that I want to do, regardless of how long it's going to take me because I really believe in it. And also I believe, you know, if, if you really have something in mind that you really want to make happen, you don't stop until it happens, regardless of whatever circumstances happen in your life. I don't like that. Um, you know, I've been asked many times how my, my career as a writer started. And the answer is usually the same, but the the longer I do this, the the more the answer evolves. So okay. to start to start, it is my mom's passing that um, sparked the, this whole journey. Uh, but really, it was just me trying to understand myself and what I can speak to others, because I know that I have a very specific mindset that most people don't understand. That's why I don't really have many male friends because most men my age, at least in my experience, have a very narrow minded vision of emotion. Mm. And it's not that there is emotionally stunted or that they don't have any. It's that generally speaking, men need to ask more questions and listen more actively when when it comes to understanding themselves and their emotion and be accepting. I want to tell my husband that one. I mean, I've been telling him for years, but. Like, people look at this and think it's a kiddie book. It's not. It's not at all. In fact, most it's actually mostly adults who read my series, Bone and Jack. Oh, really? Yeah. I like that art. That's cool. Yeah, so that's Boone, more of an urban boy. Okay. Being a chocolate bar. And then that's Jack. Who's more studious and and thoughtful, logical, philosophical? Uh, he may see he may seem 
uh, emotionally stunted, but really he's more of a theater theoretical person. Okay. And this is a Oh, that's pre pretty. just uh, this is a sneak peek to book two. That's so pretty. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, when I was first working on this, I I didn't really know what I was doing. to be honest, because I started as a screenwriter. Um, Okay. and when I was first writing books, I hated it because I was like, They're a oh, little it's just, different. it's a little different. It's just text. And how am I supposed to make this entertaining? But once I started educating myself on it and understanding, you know, I can actually hold this. I can say, this is mine. I made Yeah. this. Where if I write a film script, I have to hope that someone turns it into something. That's Or... true. You know, um, So have you had any film scripts been turned into anything? Mm, I mean, I've I've done short films by myself in the past. Okay. I mean, terrible ones, but I still did it. Uh, <laughs> it I'm counts. actually good. It counts. It does. Yeah. Because it was a learning experience. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I I'm actually planning on taking this unfinished film script. Uh. And turning it into a book. Um, I'm going to change the title, obviously, but it's essentially my twisted adaptation of the notebook. Okay. So it's it's like basically if uh, Guillermo del Toro directed it. <laughs> and then, then maybe perhaps I would have watched <laughs> it because I don't do the lovey-dovey stories. yeah. See, yes, I I always like I didn't I didn't know much about this director and, and the movies he did besides Hellboy. Mm hmm. Uh, But when I watched um, his Netflix uh, series, Cabinet of Curiosities, Mm hmm I was just like, oh, okay, some horror elements and psychological thriller. That's the kind of stuff that I do. That's what I, that's the aesthetic I'm going for in my books. cool nice Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the next project I'm working on, besides the final book of uh, my Boone and Jack series, which is going to be a total of five. okay Um, I'm working on a serial killer novel. Yeah. It's, it's going to be uh, uh, sorry, focused on a female serial killer. But to make it really interesting, I decided to do three to four character perspectives, meaning we're not focusing on uh, an origin of this person because that humanizes them. I don't want to humanize a serial killer because they're still a monster. There's Mm-hmm. no point in me, you know, uh, giving justification to their actions. Because when I was watching the the recent um, bio series of Jeffrey Dahmer Yeah. and, Ah, yes. and seeing the response from the victim's families, I'm like, okay, that to me is what the focus should be uh, in, this, in the story. Is not why did this person do what they did? How did they get to this point? It's more how did it affect others and how do they look in, to a whole society's eyes? Mm -hmm. So, so each character that I'm going to have rotate from chapter to chapter is going to show different connections that they all have to each other and to the killer. So I'm going to have a detective, a journalist, a radio host, a doorman. I think that's four. I want to have an innocent bystander, but it doesn't really work. Oh, okay. I'm going to have probably uh, a victim's family member or a family Mm -hmm. member of the killer, but we just don't know who the killer is. Yeah, yeah. Because um, that way I, I give the reader not only different perspectives, but I also give them a well-rounded uh, view of the city. And Let's yeah. let's Okay. talk a little more about mental health here. And like I said, share what you feel is important for the audience to know so that they can kind of connect and, and get some some good tips about dealing with those old wounds because it sounds like you have learned a few uh important things Mm -hmm. yeah um well like i was saying before uh when the woman the host of uh, therapy in a nutshell was talking to this uh grief uh professional uh they were they were talking about how we we tend to not just hold on to grief but hold on to uh the negativity that we create in our own heads the Okay. I guess I guess the uh, the artificial 
self grievance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the way to overcome that is to not try to overcome, to not cope with it. Coping mechanisms, though uh, useful at times, is is still not really a solution and, and and you shouldn't be looking for a solution it's more like you just have to really uh engage in the intensity of the emotion to to be okay with with the, the level of intensity and what it feels like inside you and to just let it out because when when you um well, what's the word uh ingest it and then keep it inside it stays there as stored energy that if it doesn't get a chance to be released or at least spread out evenly, it festers and becomes um, a terrible mutation that becomes uh, self traps and self traps means you're using things to distance yourself from those emotions as opposed to confronting them. Now that doesn't mean that you go on a rampage and start punching everybody. That's it, not what I'm picturing. I'm no. picturing. But you see, I, I've known so many men doing that where they're so afraid of expressing that emotion without hurting themselves or others that they're either oblivious to it or they don't see the point in it if, if they feel content. Mm. And what's so toxic about that is if... If I, if I were to ask them, are you okay? They just nod. Yep, I'm fine. It's like, okay. No, that's my husband. <laughs> um, so when it comes to old wounds that you feel that you have either suppressed long enough that it's, it's in the back of your head locked in a box or it, the opposite where it resurfaces and it's so overwhelming that you don't know how to handle it just understand that it's best for you to seek help from others, whether it's a therapist or family member first, because you know that what your instincts are, you know, what your instincts are when it comes to being overwhelmed. All of us human beings have a knee jerk response to danger mm -hmm. and it can come from us or it can come from someone else. So when you have these extremely heated moments to yourself or with others, instead of blowing up or, or, or shutting down, you just talk it out with someone. And it, it, you don't even have to talk to someone. You can talk to yourself mm -hmm. because we always think, oh, I can't stand on my own and, and I don't know how to, to handle myself. It's like, well, it's not about handling yourself. It's about, you know, just, I guess, immortalizing that, that emotion and then working through it and then moving after it because to to create space from a darkness you don't want to face is to say i am not okay with who i am i'm not okay with how i deal with things because my way feels detrimental to my health but the, the truth is emotional transparency and intensity is what makes us stronger because by putting ourselves through emotional violence that has uh, damaged us, we have to look at that damage as an opportunity to take a step back and analyze how we're going to approach it. I mean, in this, in this series uh, that I wrote, um, that's what these characters go through by themselves because the adults that I... I have them uh, being surrounded by don't really help them much. And it's because they have their own uh, self traps that became part of who they are. And these kids who are now new to the whole uh, growing up of life, they had to really lean on each other. And that's, that's what's so important about life is learning to, uh, see that you're not the only person dealing with the same thing that we always feel alone when it comes to, to pain. But you, just because someone else's pain is different than yours, doesn't mean it's any less pain, uh, painful than yours. So yeah. really all I'm saying here is when it comes to old wounds, don't be afraid to express it and don't be afraid to ask for help. That is great. 
Um, so when you were when you were saying earlier um, about having it, you know, locking it away in a box or, or pushing it away mm -hmm. um, until you rampage or whatever, um, and not necessarily physically rampage, mm. I was it, it like snapped in my head because right now I've been talking to my therapist and we've been talking about all those old wounds from mm -hmm. teenage years. Yeah. Um and it's really hard sometimes to go back and do that. Not sometimes it, it was really stinking hard. Mm -hmm. Um and having somebody to talk to about it um is super helpful. And for me she keeps going, okay, well where is our evidence? So we're we're trying to realize that my emotions are not always the truth um mm -hmm. and you know let's look at the facts and the facts are that you know i'm not a horrible person even though my emotions want to tell me that the fact mm -hmm. is so it's been uh really helpful that way but i think you're right if you maybe can't go to therapy or you're not ready to go to therapy having a, a friend that you super trust um mm -hmm can be really helpful as that first step as well yeah. or i mean talk to yourself that's what journaling is um mm -hmm. the show has had tons of guests talk about how journaling has helped them and it's basically just talking to yourself but on paper yeah i mean when i was listening to that that podcast therapy in a nutshell they're talking about exactly what your, your therapist is saying about um not loving who you are based on how you perceive your own emotions and old wounds and realizing that the self damage that you're doing to yourself it's not that you hate yourself it's that you don't know how to process um something you wish you could forget but but you can't um i don't know if you've seen the show uh Mr. Robot and with no. Rami Malik. No. Um, so <laughs> that show, psychologically speaking, was very uh intense for me. So much that I that for the first time I could only watch two episodes at a time when I was trying to binge it. Because this person, like the main character, uh Elliot, Elliot Anderson, uh, he had multiple personality disorder. Okay. And what was so interesting is that by the end of the sh of the show, we come to realize that the the version of who this person is that we are first introduced to is not who Elliot is at at his core. He he his mindset had created these um, different sections of his personality to protect himself. Yes. So. So he created a uh, uh, a make believe friend that was in the form of his father, but the version of his father that he wished his real father was. Okay. So it was like this mirror effect of the trauma that was um, ensued by something his father did to him when he was a little kid, mm -hmm. and he blocked it completely from his head when he was a child. So. So much so that even from childhood, he had a, a make-believe friend. And then it evolved into being the alternate universe uh, version of his father. Mm -hmm. And um, the different versions of himself that he presents to other people actually causes him to black out. Because he, he doesn't want to remember his actions because he knows that they can be violent knows that they can be destructive he can destroy relationships and his own sanity so it was really interesting seeing the uh explanation and exemplification of what it's like to to um to demonstrate self-preservation and that's something that we do as human beings because we're like, oh, I, I'm a decision maker. I have to make decisions today. I don't want to focus on that. Yeah. And I'm at work. I don't want to think about my, my emotions. So I'm just going to push down. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's what, that's what's so interesting about the human mind is that it's very smart and very good at protecting itself. 
mm-hmm. and sometimes it's too good at protecting itself. Right? So much so that we don't recognize who we are or why we make the decisions that we make. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm-hmm. So um, I always like to ask every guest if yeah. you could give one piece of wisdom. I was calling it advice at the beginning of the show, but I always hate advice. And mm-hmm. I always tell people, I, don't give me advice. So wisdom, I'm calling it wisdom now. Um, so if somebody is watching the show, they are really struggling with something that happened in the past. What is your mm-hmm. piece of wisdom for them? Well, let's, I'll give you the example of uh, my mother's passing. That was the first, uh, in, in terms of um, how close I was to the person, that was the first loss I had. And I admittedly took at least four years to get out of my emotional cloudiness. I was terrible the first year in, in, in her passing. So, for example, um, the day she passed away I was so such an out-of-body experience for me. One where I thought I was seeing things, where I get to the hospital, I don't understand why everyone's looking at me so mournful in the lobby, uh, like family, friends. And then I get up to my my mom's room and I go inside. My dad says what happens. And he cries and everyone in the room is crying, but I just stood there frozen. I actually felt like there was this dark shadow behind me and I actually felt a bony hand gripping my shoulder. And maybe that was just my my brain playing tricks on me, but I was convinced that death was there saying, your mom is coming with me. I'm sorry. Yeah. And when I was the last one in the room, because I was the last one to get there, I said my final goodbyes. And when I held my mom's hand, I actually still felt heat from her. So it means it just happened. Mm -hmm. Now, as to how I eventually went from a emotionally cloudy and broken state, Um, but really took time and helped me is just taking the time to talk to people and understanding what does this loss mean to me and how does, how has it changed me? What, what have I gained from this positively and negatively? Because the thing about about losing someone, most people see it as just that, a loss. They don't see it as an opportunity to revitalize themselves. But at the same time, it shouldn't take someone's passing for you to to change as a person. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, of, of approaching an old wound, and if you're dealing with one now, um, just realize that life is so unpredictable. We don't know when mm-hmm. someone we know is going to go or if someone's terminally ill, how long they have, or if they are cleared of that disease, is it going to come back? Or maybe it's not an illness. Maybe someone you know who is alive and well will die suddenly because of a car accident or something. Mm-hmm. So really what I'm trying to say is, Understand that your life is is not just unpredictable, but it's something you have to take into consideration for how many opportunities you have for yourself, how many people you can connect with, and which ones you should decide to keep or not keep in your life. So when you lose someone that is near and dear to you, and you know you're going to get into a dark place, Just remember that it's okay to be lost for a while, but you have to learn how to piece yourself back together because sometimes the people we love who try their hardest to cheer you up or help you piece yourself together, they can only do so much. Mm -hmm. It comes down to what you do. And I know that that sounds rather lonely and harsh, but the fact is it's our emotions, not anyone else. Right. Like, I know this sounds weird, but we always say, well, I'm very honest. I'm always myself to my partner and 
and the people in my life. It's like, yeah, but there are thoughts and mistakes that you've made that I'm certain you've kept to yourself. Yeah. And, and that's okay because they belong to you. That's a, that was probably the, the biggest lesson I had to learn in life is my mistakes are mine. And I don't have to tell everybody about my mistakes. I don't have to tell everyone about my deepest fears. Mm -hmm. And just because I want to have good trust with a life partner doesn't mean that I am going to completely reveal myself to them because it's not that I'm being, it's not that we're being selfish and that we're being self-preservative. It's more like we're just human beings. Yeah. It is just, it's a human nature to keep certain things to yourself, not to protect others from you, but to just see that you're okay with who you are and that you know those mistakes don't need to be uh, communicated in order to maintain or or strengthen any form of trust. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Um, so, I mean, you've already kind of mentioned your books, but now show us again um, and tell us a little bit more okay. about what it what the actual story is about. Okay, so I already showed you the first two, so I'll show you the three and four actually, I actually didn't show you <laughs> I didn't show you too long enough okay so so book two the brother's odyssey is my first attempt at uh western epic fantasy okay where uh Boone and Jack and Shami where is she oh, okay yeah she's right there okay um this is their first uh like real adventure uh, out of the city. Now, what I didn't realize that I did by writing the final book, which is being, uh, fi- uh, it's in his final edit now and oh. illustrated. Um, the, the place they go to here is actually a sister planet to Earth, which oh, is okay. uh, connected by a cosmic bridge called uh, Sahon, which has its own consciousness. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm actually going to be doing a uh, prequel book uh, about Theranosita, the sister planet. But to focus back on the series, here's book three. So this is a, I guess, a zombified wolf. Uh, (laughs) It's 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 kind of cool looking. Yeah, it's the... uh, Emerald's spirit here, that's uh, kind of like what remains of, of this uh, king that's kind of caught in between ah. the world of the living and the dead. Um, and this book, book four, was my, my first attempt at a murder mystery and keeping the uh, fantasy elements at the very end to bridge between book four and five. Um, The reason why I wanted to do a murder mystery and keep the fantasy elements to a minimum is because I really wanted to explore the adulthood of these characters and their psychology, their new relationships in their thirties and children. And um, how does this change them? Are they the same kind of, you you know, innocent child or did they grow up? because they didn't have parents that were really there for them. And their adults and peers that have always been in their lives are self-obsessed people that didn't, you know, try to guide them. Oh, so, okay. You know, they really had to learn from each other how to grow up. And sometimes that creates um, a negative perspective on themselves in life. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Very nice. And where do people get a copy? You, you can go on Amazon and it's in Kindle and paperback. Excellent. And where do they follow you? They can follow me at the same handle for all of them, AG Flitcher, on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and oh, YouTube. TikTok. I love TikTok. <laughs> yeah, that's actually my my most popular one. It's, it's I'm at to. Uh, 
1,540 people now. Oh my goodness. I'm going to, I'm just going to steal some of your people. <laughs> look at me. Look at me. He's not interesting. Yeah, I am. I am. Exactly. Be like, I'm so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> look at her hair. It's way better than his. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. And we're going to stick the links, of course, down in the description below um so people can very easily remember because i mean if you're listening to this while you're driving um or you just don't have a pen and paper around or your phone to just do it right now um you got to be able to look back so we're going to make sure to stick it down there is there any last words that you have for the viewers um yeah so to really summarize the whole series of Blue and Jack. Honestly, it started as a practice round for me. That's why each book is different. This is more just straight up urban fantasy. This is epic fantasy. This is uh, a summary of both uh, versions and then um, murder mystery. And now the final book, which will probably be the biggest one, maybe around uh, 600 pages. Um, that one... I really hope everyone reads because I worked my freaking butt off on that. I <laughs> I even I even talked to I interviewed a uh, trauma specialist oh. to make sure that I really make the final book conclusive to the character's psychology. In fact, the majority of the book focuses on an exploration of their psychology. So while they're being transported to another planet uh sahon which is the cosmic yep. energy the uh, bridge. bridge um because he, he's become fragmented and the bridge is collapsing in on itself and going towards earth in which he's going towards the other half of himself that was embedded in earth's core um he sees boon and jack as these very vital uh um i guess human pedestals of of his nature as as a cosmic being that wants an imbalance of chaos and peace um he obligates these characters to delve back into the past that they've forgotten and also their repressed fears so that not only do they mend their their wounds and move forward but they also become stronger people that he can rely on should he call upon them. And that is what creates opportunity for me as a writer, that even though the storyline of Boone and Jack will be complete, I will still find opportunities to have them as secondary or just uh, passers-by in other standalone novels. So one final thing in terms of uh, the characters and involvement in future projects, Boone will be a secondary character in a book called Red Widow Waltz, which is a very dystopian uh, book about widowers who are people that have been followed by CD government, FBI kind of mm. uh, groups that develop a VR headset program that obligate widowers to go down this, I guess, journey, uh, virtual journey, to um, not only get through their past, but also prevent them from being a problem in a city because these people have been followed by FBI agents kind of thing um, because there's a potential that they could become criminals or very dangerous to the city. So there are these potential criminals that could destroy the city. So to prevent that from happening, um, this, this company is trying to prevent that from happening by literally following them before they get into the program. I'm obviously going to develop that later. I don't know if it's going to change or not. It's always like yeah. that. But Jack um, is going to be not really involved in other stories, but he will be in that world. So there's this town I just created called Barlock, and it's very uh, seedy and, and, and ghetto and he lives up on this big hill with his uh, with his wife, who is a transgendered woman of color. Um, 
they were going to be seen as like the town's uh, safe haven as as a private detective couple. Oh, that, that was the last thing I wanted to add as well. Um, I am very big on diversity and inclusivity in all my work. So for example, Jacques is, oops, that guy. Jacques is pansexual and is a foster child. So there's a lot of layers there to him because I want to show the whole concept of love is love. Yeah. And that's why he was there. And and Boone, though he is straight, I didn't paint him as the typical boy that doesn't understand emotions. It's more like he wants to. So he puts in a lot of work. And it's all a high lesson to male authors that you don't have to pay, paint your male characters as the rough and tough. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's overdone and no one cares anymore about that. <laughs> Nick Swartzen was the last one. <laughs> Uh, oh, right. sorry um uh, one more thing yeah so um i really want people to understand that when i have lgbtq characters it's not me trying to be woke i'm <laughs> i just like to include all kinds of people in fact all of only one mayor in in this in this series is white everyone else is either of color or just a different ethnicity or a different background so if you understand, anyone can be anyone. Yeah. So, yeah. Very nice. Always good to be inclusive. And I just love that you added in that it's not that you want to be woke, because that's the big the big popular word going around <laughs> right now, right? Everybody just yeah. wants to be woke. I'm not a trend, I'm not a trend uh follower. I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so thank you so much for being on the show. Everyone be sure to check out the links down in the description below. Um get your copy of the book so you can be all read up by the time number five comes out. Oh that's what I was gonna ask you. Now is the story very much in order or can you read it right like oh you mean ones? like can you read them? Oh, okay. Um first three have to be read consecutively because they all intersect. Okay. Uh, book four jumps to their adulthood, so you could read it on its own if you really wanted to. Okay. Um, there are references to the first three books, but I did write it as if it was a standalone novel. Okay. Um, in fact, I had someone uh, who does a true crime podcast read it, and he was able to read book four, no problem, without needing information from the first uh, three books. Okay. And he said I did a good job of combining uh, modern and Victorian culture. Wonderful. Okay, so that's good. So one, two, three in order before you can pick up and read. Yeah, but not five. Five, you have to read everything. <laughs> <laughs> five brings it all together. Yeah. So you know what? Just read them all together. Yeah. And Do it, guys. Then probably solved. Buy my book now. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Exactly. And give me your money. <laughs> Use the affiliate link. <laughs> Keep the show going. Um, <laughs> no, really, is this important? Um, so thank you again for being on the show and for sharing um, a little bit about who you are um, and what you do. And the books look they're pretty cool. So those of you who are listening podcast styles, sorry that you can't see the covers, um, but you could just go to Amazon and order them and then you would see it. So yeah. back to the whole buy the book. Thank you for having me, Randy. <laughs> You're so very welcome. As always, thank you so much for the amazing guests that we have on the show. Um, be sure to check out their links down in the description below. If you want to support the channel, go ahead and check out our merch store. We've got some very cool things on there. That's my favorite. Sorry, I'm busy ending the stigma. Um, but there's some other very cool designs. 10% of the proceeds always goes back to the Canadian Mental Health Association. Be sure to follow us on Facebook at RV Media because we have some great new shows coming up and you never want to miss any of those episodes. And remember, the only way to end the stigma of mental health is to speak openly and honestly. Bye!